Hi, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, really thrilled to be here. I last year I had total data data Gotham envy and um, was uh, thrilled when when Hillary asked me to speak this year and proud to AT and T to be a sponsor. Um, I'm the director of statistics research at AT and T out in New Jersey. And you might wonder why someone from New Jersey is kicking off the, the Data Gotham conference. And I can think of two reasons. One is in New Jersey, at least in suburban New Jersey, we kind of think of ourselves as part of the New York community, even if you guys don't think of us as part of the New York community. Um, and the, uh, the other reason is that we are uh, just in a few weeks going to move into a floor in this building. This is 33 Thomas Street down in Tribeca. It's a huge 30 floor building with no windows that was built in the Cold War to house our infrastructure, our uh, communications infrastructure, and was built to literally withstand nuclear attack. Um, if you went up to the roof yesterday, this was a picture taken from the rooftop yesterday in Tribeca, and you'll see it's the big black hole among the other buildings because there's no lights or windows or anything associated with it. Um, so, um, so those of you with green dots, if you're interested in looking for a, a cool building with some hipster cred, and why do I think it has hipster cred? Well, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's nuclear bomb proof, it's radiation fallout proof, and I think it's certified zombie proof. So um, you, uh, you should join us there if you want to. Come talk to me afterwards if you're, if you're interested. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Uh, what I'm here to talk about is how we are using our data to make cities better and more efficient. And so in the last, I'd say, five years or so, there's been this movement, um, a lot of companies and a lot of academic work towards using data to make cities smarter, to make them more efficient, to um, help them use their resources more efficiently, and how to make them more sustainable. And so you see things like um, Chicago. Uh, Chicago has been putting their crime data online for over a decade. They were one of the first cities to really be um, active with putting their data out there. Um, Chicago also puts data out there on the streets in real time when they have a snowstorm so you know when your street's going to get plowed. Boston has uh, this thing called Street Bump where they crowdsource information from the community about where potholes are so you can um, report where a pothole is and they have this app and ultimately they want the app to use the accelerometer in your phone to identify when there's a, a pothole automatically and send it to their Department of Public Works. So there's a lot of great stuff being done in cities and in New York last year here at Data Gotham. Uh, Michael Flowers gave a talk um, partially about problematic manholes, but it was about other things as well. And um, the New York City office with data analytics is, um, is doing great work. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it right here. That's why I kept talking. I don't know how long this has been out. We're working on it. I'll just, I'll just keep talking. Get data off of all of these um, cell phones that are out there and in your pocket, at least th those of you who are AT&T customers. And um, you may have noticed if you're um, an AT&T customer that once or twice you might get a call dropped. It probably doesn't happen that often, right? <laughs> um, we know it happens. We're not proud of it. It's not good for you. It's not good for us. You know, we want to fix these things. So every time a call is dropped, we get a record of that, and that record has a a geographic um, key on it, and we can s use the data from our network that we're learning about dropped calls to try and make the network better, figure out where we can put the next cell tower, figure out where we spend our resources to go fix cell towers. Can we figure out if something's misconfigured in the network? Um, so these are things that we do in the, in the data mining community at AT&T. And, and so we have this data, um, and we thought, a bunch of us sat around and we thought, can we use this data in any way to do something other than network studies? And can we use it in a way that can be a benefit to society? Because we know that there are people out there who think, you know, there's this company that has all this information about our, our cell phones. We want to kind of change the narrative. You know, can we use it for some social good and um, hopefully, um, you know, get people to realize that we're using data for, for good and not evil? 
And so I have my, my, my legal slide here that my lawyers make me put up, but I, I really want to stress that we take data security and data privacy very, um, very seriously. Every time I want to do one of the studies I'm going to talk to you about, I have to go in front of a board of our lawyers and our regulatory people and our ethics board, and we have this internal review board that's similar to a, a university that has external legal review and all this stuff. So we really do take data privacy seriously, and all the studies we do are in um, anonymous and aggregate form. So we're, I don't have that access to who you are. I just have a, a random ID on a phone, and, and we, um, we do our analysis in, in anonymous and aggregate form. So, okay. So what data do we have? I want to stress that the, the stuff that you're going to see is not that you are sitting in that seat right now. We don't have um, GPS level information from our phones. Um, what we collect, and I'm going to be showing you, is data off of the cellular network. So when you make a phone call or a, a text message, we know what cell tower um, completed that call. So here in New York, that may be a couple blocks away. It may be on top of this building. We have a lat long associated with that. We also know the antenna that connected that call, so that gives us a directionality associated with it. So when you make a call or a text, we can see the, the lat long of the cell tower associated with that and maybe directionality associated with it. So we've done a bunch of studies with that data. I'm going to give you a very quick run through in my, in my short time here of some of the studies we've done to try and learn about how people move around cities and what we might be able to do to help them out. Our first study was called um, A Tale of Two Cities. The idea was we would take a sample of people in New York and in LA and study what we could learn about the, the cell phones. And we studied basically how did the devices move around the city during the day. And you can make some assumptions about how people are commuting. And um, we concluded that, surprise, people in LA commute three to five times longer in distance than people in New York do. It's not that surprising. Interestingly, people in New York seem to get the heck out of city, the city more frequently than people in LA on the weekends. Um, that was an interesting finding. Uh, but we were able to calculate things like the median daily, daily ranges that people were traveling. And um, you know, so there were some interesting results there. And then we decided to take it a little bit closer to home and study my hometown of Morristown, New Jersey, um, where we have this nice statue. It's got some revolutionary history. And we thought, what would happen if we studied a small city like Morristown and we looked at all of the traffic that came through one city in about six months? And what would we learn about how people move around and how people commute and how the city can plan to make their transportation more efficient? So we, um, we contacted the town council of Morristown and we did this in collaboration with them and had some interesting findings. So we were studying um, from the network data each cell tower in Morristown and what the traffic was off of the network. And so this is an example of one of those charts for one of those cell antennas. The lines on top of the axis represent voice calling, and the lines below the axis represent text messaging. And so this is across all of the six months of our, of our studies on a Monday for one particular cell antenna. And we would put those together in this plot of least multiples where um, each column represents a day of the week, and each row represents a different cell antenna. And so you can see that each antenna has a little bit of a different personality, different flavor. Some are busier on the later in the day versus earlier in the day. Some have more texting, some have more voice. And so we were learning about how people were using the network and what parts of the town they were in, because each of these antennas represents a physical part of, of Morristown. If you look at some of these, you get some interesting stories. So here's one antenna where you see some, remember the, um, the texting are the spikes on the bottom. And so you see some spikes um, early in the morning. This was the antenna pointed towards the high school. So you see texting spikes when they get to school, when they go to lunch, and when they get out of school. When they get out of school, you also see a spike in the voice traffic. They've got to call their parents to get home. Their parents are clueless and don't know how to text, so they have to actually use a voice call to do that. So we thought that was telling an interesting story. This was the antenna that's pointed towards downtown Morristown, which has a bunch of, of bars and restaurants and has a reasonable nightlife. Um, and so you see the texting activity in the late night hours on Saturday, um, you know, between roughly 10 and, and 2. But then at 2 o'clock, you see the spike in voice traffic. They've got to get home. They've got to call their spouse. They've got to call a cab. They've got to figure out how to get home. So we showed this to the town council. We said, here's some interesting stories we're learning about the town. And they said, well, hey, if you can tell us where these guys are going home to after they've been drinking in Morristown and are getting out at 2 o'clock in the morning, um, if they're going to like Denville, which is right down the road, then maybe we would have some evidence that would, that would give us reason to start a shuttle service from Morristown to, to Denville, or some way they would know how to maybe use resources to get the drunk people home. So um, we thought that was an interesting outcome of this kind of uh, research and how it would 
uh, might benefit the town. Um, in continued conversations with the planners, um, there almost, almost their entire focus was on traffic. The center of Morristown is this big green, there's a one-way road that goes around it. It's always you know, packed with traffic. And, uh, and they just, they, how do we get these cars from idling in the middle of our city? You know, we've got to get these cars off the road. But we don't know. We know there's cars there, but we don't know where they're coming from and where they're going to. We don't really know what the path is. So we could probably help you with that. Because if they knew how people were traveling, maybe they could reroute it around the green or make the, the transportation network more efficient. So we were able to study for them. We looked at the phones that we saw that seemed to be um, workers in Morristown, so the people who came to Morristown to work during the day. And they wanted to know, where are these people coming from? The people who are commuting to Morristown, where are they coming from? And so we looked at the devices, the devices that seemed to be in Morristown during the day and then weren't there in the evening, aggregated that by, by a zip code, and then plotted this um, smooth spatial view of it so that you can see that the intensity of people coming um, is a little bit higher from the, this is Morristown here, it's a little bit higher from the north. There's some pockets of, strong pockets of people come in. But there's a fair number of people that do come to Morristown from the areas between New York City and Morristown, and even some that come out from, from Brooklyn. Don't ask me why, but um, they, uh, it seems like a horrible commute. But uh, it was interesting to see that there were a lot of people who came from far away to work in, in Morristown. We're able to look at plots like this in different situations, different seasons. Is summer different than winter? Um, is weekends, whoops, I'm going to go back to point to the person in the back. The, um, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the weekends have a much more concentrated. People are not coming from far away to come to Morristown on the weekend. Um, we studied the St. Patrick's Day Parade, which is kind of a big deal in suburbia out there for us. I know you guys have your own St. Patrick's Day um, options here. And so we, we looked at, it's a huge event in Morristown, and um, we get about, I don't know, 10 times uh, the, the people in Morristown on St. Patrick's Day than we would on a normal Saturday. Um, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> um, and we were able to study, you know, the concentrations, where people tended to come to, um, to go to the parade. Not surprisingly, they came more from the west, where there's not that much going on, and less so from the east, where people have other um, options. It's going to be hard to give the rest of the talk without, without visuals, but I'll do my best. Um, so again, the next, the next topic we addressed was what were the, we know where people are coming from, but what routes are they taking into Morristown? And so we identified the top 13 commuting paths that people might take to get into Morristown, including two train routes. And we said, you know, how can we estimate the traffic on those, on those routes? Now, you'd think we could just see where the phones are traveling, but it's not quite that easy. The data that we get are um, a sequence of cell tower, you know, a sequence of cell towers as your phone gets handed off from one cell tower to another. And we have to map that to one of these, uh, one of these routes. It turns out if you drive along a particular route, um, two people driving with phones right next to each other are going to be connected to different cell towers and have different handoff patterns. And so we actually took, we actually drove each of these 13 routes 10 times each, and we had four phones in the car each time, and each call, each phone was connected on a, on a call. It was, it was a bit of an endeavor. And we mapped the cell tower handoff signals that we saw for each call um, for each route. And we made plots like this and plots like this that I'm not going to have time to go into. But basically what we learned is there's a huge amount of variance in the type of cell tower pattern, sequence patterns that we saw. And so, um, but we had, now we had training data and we could fit a model to say if we saw a cell tower sequence, what route was it in? But what we also needed in order to do that classification task was um, a distance metric. And so here's my one gratuitous technical slide where I talk about the, the distance metric that we use to fit our classification model. It's called earth mover distance. And the reason I put it here is because it's a, it's, it's a um, technique that not a lot of people are aware of, but it's a really cool, if you're, if you're in the market for a distance metric, consider earth mover distance because it was new to me and I thought it was, it was, it was really cool and it has a neat history. And um, I'm not going to go into the technical details, but it has a Wikipedia page so you can look it up for yourself. Um, but using um, earth mover distance, we were able to fit that classification model and make estimates of the traffic coming into Morristown along the different routes. And you can see that um, the heaviest route was from the north, which is in accordance with the previous study we had done that showed that most people were coming from the north. But we also estimate the relative um, numbers of people coming in from train versus car, coming in from the highways versus the secondary roads. And the best thing for the town council for this, they can get estimates of traffic from the stripes they put in the road. 
but it's expensive and it takes a long time to get the data. But they could make changes. They could see how if they made changes in traffic patterns, signaling patterns, if that changed how the routes that people took into, the, into, uh, <clears throat> into Morristown. And that ability to get fast feedback from data was a really important, um, really important point for them as to how they would use the data to make the, the city better. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, uh, so that, that, was a, that was a real success and um, the, the town council was really um, excited to work with us and it's an ongoing collaboration. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is when I give talks at conferences like this, um, the, a question I often get is, hey, that's great for you guys at AT&T, but can you open up your data to the community so that we can you know, work with some of this awesome data that you have? And unfortunately, the answer is always no, right? We've got, you know, I've, we've got, we're the steward of your data, and we take that seriously, and we don't want to give that out to anyone else, and we have our own anonymization practices. Uh, it's proprietary data. We, can't, we just can't share it. But so we've got a, a research endeavor right now um, in, to build synthetic data. So the idea is to take all the data that we have and to create synthetic data that has the same statistical properties as the real data. So in terms of the geographical distributions of where people are at different times of the day, where they go to at different parts of the day, um, attributes associated with those devices, can we create synthetic data that at the margins has the same statistical properties? It would allow people to do research on data like this without having data for, for actual, um, actual devices. Uh, we, think it's, we think it's an exciting way to try and get the community involved in doing research like that. There's a lot of, a lot of issues with trying to guarantee differential privacy with this data that you have, and we're, we're um, working on that uh, right now. So with that, um, I, I would like to say that if we are really excited to be moving into this space in New York and be a part of this great community, um, we've got, um, we're trying to start collaborations with the Center for uh, Urban Science at NYU. Um, and the Smart Cities Institute at Columbia. Um, there's just a lot of activity in this area right now. Uh, some of you in the audience might be um, involved in that, and if you are, please come speak to me afterwards, because I'd love to see how we can collaborate. Thank you very much.